Okay. So, but Diana, yeah, could you tilt your screen just a little bit? Because it's um. Is that driving you crazy? What? A, <laughs> <laughs> That's better. <laughs> well, one of the nice things about Zoom is that you know it's easier to tell who's speaking, and oh, okay. when you can see people's faces, it's a little easier to understand what they're saying sometimes. Okay. So it does it does help. <laughs> Oh, Thanks. one quick thing before we get started. This is probably what most of you guys are already doing if you've used Zoom is it probably the easiest thing to do is to mute if you're not talking and then the background noise is reduced. So the little microphone. And and if anyone starts talking without unmuting, we'll remind you because we can because you'll be able to hear us. <laughs> That has happened before too. So, um, well, I thought maybe, uh, I don't know, perhaps Holly, if uh, you would like to start us off with just a little brief history of when the, the coliform bacteria issue became known and what has happened since then, just to give us a little perspective. I and sure can. Um. And then if you have questions or anything like that, we can kind of go over the timeline and the process. Um, so I have been employed with the city of Lewistown for 15 years. Um, the coliform problem was long before my time with the city. Um, I think it dates back closer to the 80s. Um, information is available um, on the EPA and DEQ's water watch. Um, where you can find that uh, testing data um, and it's all super easy and anybody can search it um, so I would definitely route you all to that if you want to kind of date back um, my guess is it goes back further than even um, you know the electronic data does so <laughs> um, so over the course of my employment with the city um, you know we've done um, really the same testing. So what we are required by DEQ to do is test seven sample sites. Um, those sites are throughout our distribution system. And so throughout the community, um, and then we have three sets of sites. Um, and so every third month we're back. Um, so we have a three month kind of rotation. So we have a total of 21 sample sites. random coliforms um, they typically would show up in uh, like late fall um, or early fall late summer kind of when people were turning off their irrigation system um, which is the time that um, our water consumption is obviously the lowest and uh, so that is kind of traditionally when we've seen them um, i think over the course of probably the last eight years we've seen the frequency and kind of that pattern change a little bit more we began witnessing or seeing um you know some coliform hits um in the spring or earlier in the summer that sort of thing um we had for a long time thought it was you know that water consumption dropped but yet our water temperature because we're storing it above ground um, for the most part uh would start to heat up and so obviously more bacteria grows We adjusted um, some operations, you know, changed the amount of storage we kept in our tanks and things like that, and none of that appeared to make any difference. Uh, kind of at the same time, DEQ is changing their regulations um, and adopted the revised total coliform rule, and so uh, that came into play too. And so, what year was that revised regulation? Um, I would have to double check. Um, they actually waited to the very last second before they adopted the EPA regulation. And off the top of my head, I don't have that information. Um, but it was, I think, probably close to um, like 2010, 2012, somewhere in that vicinity. So within the last kind of the same timeline, the last eight to 10 years, I would estimate. Um, and so what that did is it didn't change 
uh, the testing requirements. Um, it adopted kind of this um, find and fix approach is what they call it. And so if you did have a coliform positive sample, um, you one was okay, more than one a year, it triggered a level two assessment. And so DEQ was to come in and, and offer their guidance, their support. Um, and so they would do these um, walkthroughs through the system and try and help you fix these problems. Um, and so that's kind of how we got to it. Um, we continued to get more and more uh, level two assessments. Um, they gave us an opportunity to basically uh, shock chlorinate um, for a period of about 30 days um, at a set residual. And that was like, okay, let's see if this works. This is your last hope of uh, not getting a, uh, you know, the full disinfection orders. And that really, what we did must have been about two years ago now that we did that stuff. Um, and then I think within just a few months, uh, we got a positive sample too. So again, these sample sites um, are throughout our distribution system. There's not one, and I've said it a lot, smoking gun, one location, um, things like that. We had as part of our level two assessments gone through and evaluated um, our sampling procedures, worked with uh, different labs to make sure that there was not inconsistencies with labs. Um, went through our sampling locations. Um, coliform, I mean, again, we probably have coliform on our toothbrushes, things like that. So it's extremely sensitive to, um, you know, if you are, are testing in a, a residential sink or a commercial sink and you leave the cap down or something like that, you sometimes can get positive samples because of testing procedures or um, unclean, you know, they recommend, you know, the standard two knob faucets, those sort of things, uh, rather than a mixer style. And so we went through all of that stuff to make sure that there was just no procedural errors as well. Um, and ultimately none of it um, had helped the difference, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do they mean by a, a shock chlorinate? Um, so what wanted us to do is just to try chlorination for a period of uh, I think it was 30 or 45 days um, and basically just do a temporary chlorination basically what oh. we do is um, you know kill any growth um, you know obviously we all know, um, anybody that has a dog knows kind of the dog dish the, they call that biofilm um, and so they they attempted to kill that um, and see if that was the issue um, with that growing inside the pipe. Sometimes they, they cling, you know, the bacteria can cling to that um, and cause some growth or some sampling uh, problems, so. Yeah, okay, so yeah, because when, when they say shock, I always feel like it's like they're trying to shock the system, like with a big, so it's not necessarily an overly large amount, but it's just what you think is needed. Yeah, it was just a shock to the system more than anything, from going to, from zero to something for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And let's see, I saw some, there were some references to you know, temporary chlorination, which I guess is what you've been talking about. And by full time, you mean what you're going to. Um, so right now what we're operating on is a temporary chlorination system or the system that was designed to allow shock system, as I said it, you know, just that one time shot. Um, and we've continued to operate that for a couple of years now. Um, that is a pretty crude system. Um, it has some flow pace capabilities, but it has no monitors or things like that. It's not an automated system. And I, so I know that a few of you that had comments on the EA asked, um, you know, so this would have a lot more integration into the SCADA and the, those remote um, kind of controls type systems. So that allows us to dial down the amount of chlorine to as little as possible, but make sure we're getting a cons consistency throughout the system. And so it would be a much more accurate um, better 
easier and uh, consistent controls of that chlorination. So that's what you are going toward. Right. Yeah, yeah. That would be what the project would be designed to do. Okay. You could, so it could be more fine tuned than it is. Correct. Yep. Okay. And well, I'll just ask a, one more question, kind of related, and then we can, you know, start seeing what other questions everybody has. Um, as far as the places where you would uh, do the the chlorinating. Um, let's, uh, let's see, maybe I'll try to get fancy here and put up the map if I can. <laughs> so can y'all see that? No, try and hit your share screen. That's right. Duh. You know, I was forgetting. <laughs> We've all been learning. I'll probably be the one that talks when the mute's on because I usually <laughs> have to it. So, there we go. Now you can see it. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So, um, it seemed like originally they were considering. A number of different places for the chlorination, but then in the uh, environmental document, it said it was going to be at the source and here at lower pump, and then over here at the at Castle Ridge. Was it were those the three that were selected? Um, you know, this project is not designed. So basically, where we're at in the process is we are in the process of doing the preliminary engineering report. Uh, what that document, of course, is, is uh, to funders, and this is you know, both uh, DNRC and um, the DEQ. Um, there isn't a ton of detail in this um, because the project itself has not been designed. Um, and so, they had several locations. I think we're optimistic at this point that we can accomplish that um, the lowest level possible of chlorination with the three locations, um, but obviously further design would have to occur before that went to construction. Uh -huh. Yeah, the, the three that were mentioned as selected, what for, you know, whether they are not, whether they, yeah, it was this one, and this one and this one. And I was just thinking if you're trying to do the most distribution, why you wouldn't be using uh, a site, this site up here if you're trying to minimize. Much of our water doesn't actually see a storage site. Um, you know, I'm at the office tonight and there is not any, um, basically any, it comes straight in from the spring and right down. Um, it's actually Fifth Avenue most of the way and then starts branching off. And so, um, you know, it's just traveled, I think something like 12 miles in from the spring. And so we need another location for a boost. Um, and that's why the upper tank was not the ideal location, but it was actually the, the booster pump um, or the lower pump station, I think is how they call it. Uh, yeah. So, uh, okay. Well, I guess for me personally, I just really seem like why would we have to chlorinate down here at the spring? And I know it's supposedly a DEQ rule, but it seems like it's a DEQ rule that we should challenge because the water down there is is clean water and why mess with it way down here? Yeah. And so the um, so the DEQ requirement requires us to uh, chlorinate our entire distribution system. So it's prior to our first connection. So our first connection on our water system is Kitty Foreman's, and that is you know the house right um, right next to uh, the the park at uh, the Big Spring. That's why that um, so happens. I'm, can you say that again? So we have to chlorinate our entire system. So prior yeah. to the connection. Our first connection is 
very next house from the spring. So we it have is. services all the way up and down the creek that um, are served by city water. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, there's something I want to say close to 20 um, services up and down the creek. So. Uh, Before so, it actually gets to the city. That's correct. Okay. So, Holly, how close is that then to where Big Spring is identified on the map? Um, at this level, I don't know where Big Spring is. I mean, the actual spring, the spring dome. So, if you're at the restroom, you know, um, or the flagpole there at the at the park of the right. factory, literally, it's the next fence line. Just behind those buildings is Foreman's house. So. So oh, I have a question about the chlorination at the spring. And even though it's a DEQ requirement, I mean, how do they take into effect any possible impact um, uh, on aquatic species and, and wildlife and, you know, birds and that whole thing? And, and I, I mean, I, I just don't know that much about it, but I would immediately have a concern, you know, adding chlorine to, to our primary. Chlorine itself would be added at a building or an enclosed. And so um, they have a ton of construction regulations, of course, too. So uh, spill protection and things like that is all gonna be handled um, through that process. So it's not gonna be like um, the pure chlorine getting in there. Um, is it more the, the pipes or something like that that you're concerned about or like this industrial type uh, product Getting out. It would be it would be pipe leakage over time, and the other issue would be um, in periods of flood um, when there's a tremendous amount of water um, coming down that could spill over from I don't I don't know what the holding tanks are or where it's added, but I mean just those kinds of things that are not in the the world of of the perfect world where the pipes never crack and you know the we never have a flood and there's never overflow, those kinds yep. of things, those um, extenuating circumstances. Okay, so I know I'm gonna try and, and be as um, simple as possible, um, but if I make more questions, um, let me know and I can try and clarify it. So basically, uh, we're adding, obviously, the amount of chlorine that you can have in a, in a drinkable potable water system is extremely small. And so that chlorine, I mean, if it's spilled on the ground or it, I mean, it's always trying to get to zero. Uh, that's what chemicals do is, you know, go back to um, the air or something like that and get back to like the baseline. And so if that spills on the ground, um, chlorine is going to try and it's an oxidizer so it's going to uh, oxidize and uh, be used up um, the demand of the dirt or the even if it was in the creek is going to be almost immediately uh, consumed and so there's no free chlorine at that point um, you know this environmental assessment was forwarded on to the fwp too and we did not receive any comments from that um, but even prior to that, um, from an operation standpoint, the city asked um, our engineers to provide us basically um, if we did, and it's more along the lines of if we had a large main break or something like that. Obviously, we're routing it to a storm drain that's going to get back to the creek or something. And so we got a technical memo that basically spelled that out, that it's consumed long before um, getting to a stream or something like that. In, in the pipes, if it's at that lower concentration. So my bigger fear would be um, more the industrial leak or something like that. And even for our temporary system, we have to have spill containment that's capable of containing twice the amount we keep on site and things like that. Um, and I'm sure that they would recognize where or, uh, you know, so during a period of flood or something that wouldn't be affected. Thank you. So, have there been uh, bacteria documented in the main that connects the spring to downtown? We have not, or at least that I'm aware, we have not seen any coliform. Mm -hmm. with oh. So again, so that indicates that that water is, uh, it is remaining clean there. 
So we have we've mentioned all of this to DEQ too. We have tried to work that angle of, of getting a variant or allowing something um, mm -hmm. from their usual requirements. And and basically they have been very unwilling to uh, uh, budge on anything at this point. So. Yeah, because I mean, the resource that we have here is a unique resource that is sort of defines the character. I understand the unfortunate necessity to chlorinate, you know, in the city, but uh, to, to chlorinate out where there is uh, no contamination or bacteria that we can see is just, it just seems like a travesty <laughs> to be chlorinating that part of it. And I just wonder if they know what they're dealing with. Um, you know, no, I they know what a resource they're dealing with. Yeah, and I mean, I personally have shared that with them. I know uh, both Clint and Dave also went up and we appealed to um, some of the heads of DEQ, heads of the Water Quality Division and the Deputy Director. Um, and I mean, they cordially listened to us, um, but I don't think there was much give there. Um, many of them, you know, have been down here. Um, I've walked through with many DEQ staff um, and they, I believe that they do recognize what a gem Lewistown's water is. Um, none of us want this or take this lightly either. Um, and I, I think that they feel the same way, honestly. Yeah. I mean, we all moved to Lewistown with the, all the, the talk about, and it's only one of three cities in the United States that doesn't have to treat its water and because it's 99% pure and the, and the, the sad thing is it still is. <laughs> I mean, yeah. when it comes out of the ground, it still is. And so um, that's, I guess that's um, what makes it such a sensitive issue. Absolutely. So, well, uh, I don't know, does anybody else have uh, questions they'd like to continue with? I, I'd like to ask, um, so is this a forever thing then, or is it till, I mean, is this a, a permanent solution that will be required from here to eternity or is there hope that it could resolve itself or do you guys have a feel for that at all any facts or uh, expert opinions um i guess i don't think we have facts or expert opinion <laughs> um but it would be kind of what was shared with us that it would be a a full-time requirement so not a temporary not any hope of lessening that requirement, um, you know, even 20, 30, 50 years down the road. What happens if the water quality increases though? And you and you you go for a period of time, is there some kind of a situation where you can go for six months with no coliform? I guess that you, you can't stop and test, in other words. Exactly, right. Our requirement would be full-time disinfection. And so we would be out of compliance if we did stop and test. So there uh, that I, I can't answer for people. One is they ask, well, why don't we just totally replace the infrastructure um, of the pipes within the city? And um, I, 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 I think if Holly, you could answer or look at the other two options, the, the UV and um, the filtration, also add that into the mix, the cost of the those two extra, plus what would it cost to replace the pipes? Um, you know, I have seen numbers before on that. Um, we have close to 60 miles of, of water mains within the city. Um, distribution system. And so we're way upward of a million dollars, or sorry, a hundred million dollars to do that. Um, just to repeat, um, you know, at this price. And so obviously there's something like 12 stream crossings, creek crossings, um, things like that, that would add to complexity as well. Um, but that's kind of the number that I have been told um, again, it's just a very cursory estimate. 
not based on sizes and stuff like that. So not a deep dive into that. Um, I don't know what, what questions do you have regarding the other alternatives? Um, you know, I think the information that Pesha provided, and I think it's still up on our website, kind of went over the pros and cons of all of the methods, um, as well as at least a, an engineer's estimate on those costs. And I don't have it right in front of me, but I know it's still on the website. Yeah, well, I have it here, and um, it is obvious the, the UV and the ozone are prohibitively expensive, I guess. I don't, I don't think anybody's going to argue about that. I guess what I wish they had done was just that they had just explained them a little better uh, so that people know what we're dealing with. Now, for example, it starts out by saying that both of them are usually used as a primary treatment. Well, what, what do you mean by a primary treatment? Um, my knowledge of what primary treatment is doesn't relate to that at all. Um, and it talks about, you know, it needs in certain installation space and blah, blah, blah. And I just would like to know a little more about it, even though I understand they are prohibitively expensive, but um, it seems like they could have explained that a little more. Well, and I think, I mean, this was part of a presentation too, and I know, um, definitely, there was probably more presented than um, what was in the slideshow, um, which is what you're probably looking at. Um, you know, it was our hopes, and I think we had our first meeting at the first week of uh, March, and so we had no idea that we would literally be shut down just a couple weeks later. And so it was our intention to uh, have a second meeting. Um, you know, that would provide more detail and hopefully we'd get more uh, public participation at this event um, sometime in April. Um, we still have to have that second meeting. And so um, as we start going through this lessening of um, kind of our requirements and social distancing and stuff like that, we still will have to have that. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're optimistic that we can have that um, in the next couple of months, um, even prior to um, you know, getting grant funds and stuff like that. These funds um, that we're applying for now wouldn't actually be session. Unfortunately, um, when we all appealed to the Department of Commerce um, to increase their timeline, to lengthen their timeline on um, these PERs and the application process, they did and they did it by about a month and a half. Um, so it wasn't very long, um, even though that still gives them plenty of time to review it. We were hoping we would have a little more time to prepare these documents and get this public participation. Um, I know many of you commented on the uh, preliminary uh, environmental assessment, and I think many of your comments um, will end up being addressed or included in the final environment. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, that it, I think, um, well, the straying off where we were going, but just say, I thought that was a very insufficient document. And I mean, I hope you didn't pay them a lot of money for it because it's a really poor document. Well, and it's just a very, very small portion of the, um, the package. I mean, a, a preliminary engineering report um, is probably the biggest binder, probably close to, you know, your four to six inch binder full of documents that explores uh, the geology and history of the location. And, and so it has just this very cursory um, overview. It's not until you get further down, you know, once we do like a construction documents and stuff like that, they would have to do uh, at more environmental assessment uh, for that project. And obviously, you know, that's where you, they got, I know some of you had questions on the lead testing and stuff like that. And so that would typically explore, you know, and unless we were getting into like old paint or something like that, um, traditionally you wouldn't have any lead-based paint um, because this would be new construction and not an, an old building or something like that. Um, but they would have to do the environmental assessment for the actual project being constructed as well. Yeah. Yeah. Rita, could um, I? Yeah, go ahead. All right, Clint, did you have anything else you wanted to say? Um, 
So uh, just speaking as a city commissioner and Holly, if I, if I misstate anything, you correct me, okay? But uh, in my time on the commission, um, I, I think it's safe to say that, that DEQ has never been thrilled or for many years has not been thrilled that we have not been chlorinating or treating our water. I think they've kind of, um, we certainly have been the exception. And I think for those of us who live here, um, uh, just speaking for myself personally, and I think everyone, every one of you agrees, you know, that is, it's, it's part of our identity as a community. It's one of the greatest things about Lewistown is that, you know, how many times have you told people you, you turn on the And uh, it's, it's a really important um, distinguisher for us. And uh, I think it's almost part of our psyche. Um, it, you know, the, the last federal administration made all these changes to these regulations on water quality. And one of those regulations, and again, I've said this many times, and Holly, you correct me if I'm wrong on this, but one of those changes uh, gave our Montana DEQ, they had, under the previous regulations, they could work with us, but they weren't, they didn't have the authority to make us do chlorination. They could work with us when we had problems and, you know, they were looking over our shoulders, but with the change in the regulations, you know, it kind of went from uh, they may look the other way to they, they will not look the other way. They will impose these regulations on us. And that's what started this process. We've had, we've had these, these coliform hits for decades. No one, to my knowledge, has ever gotten sick or died in Lewistown from this. Um, I think if you put it to a vote, you know, and, and the city, as a city commissioner, you know, we, we, I can't speak for Clint and the others here, but, you know, I get beat up all the time on this. You know, we've not changed anything that we are doing to maintain our system. Um, it's a change in the regulations. And when uh, Clinton, Holly, and I and the engineer went to, to the meet with the DEQ people, the DEQ administrative staff, I thought, said all the right things. And then sitting next to me is the steely-eyed uh, enforcement guy, and he's having none of it. I mean, he's not even smiling. He's got no sense of humor. He doesn't want to be there. And uh, Clint, I don't know what your experience of that was, but my experience was uh, we, we're, we're getting nowhere with this guy that, you know, he's holding all the cards in his hand and he's just letting this game play out. But uh, uh, they have been... Um, was that a DEQ person? Yeah, it was their D... It was, it was the... You had the administrators sitting there, the political appointees and others, and, and then you had the enforcement guy, the guy from the, I, I think that's the division, Holly, I may have it, I may be using the wrong yeah. word, but he's sitting there, you know, with his arms across his chest and uh, he ain't budging. So we've had a change in a federal regulation, which is, which is in DEQ, and you know, I'm not trying to beat up on DEQ here, but in their minds, it changed their, um, that they uh, really couldn't come in and make us do anything to what they are required to if they're going to follow the EPA regulations. And so um, if anybody has any idea, you know, the barring uh, a change in, you know, I think some of the changes that have been made in the EPA regulations under the current administration, I think I asked our engineer, I think Holly, if I have this right, you know, did that changed the mandate that DEQ felt they had to make us chlorinate or do something else uh, but to meet their regulations and the answer was no that that hasn't changed and um, so we're really uh, you know we're really up against it the uh, if, if the chlorination is the cheapest of our options by far and mm -hmm. You know, the, the new chlorination, the, the permanent system, and Lori, you know, there's no going back. I think once we cross this, uh, you know, once we cross the Rubicon here, we ain't going back. Um, hopefully the, the spikes in the flavor, the taste, you know, if you go down, we, we dosed it. I mean, they get, they get a full dose and hopefully that will all smooth out. That's part of this engineering study. But um, 
I think the city commission is sick about this. You know, none of us wants to be sitting on the commission that, that chlorinates. Holly doesn't want to be the city manager that chlorinates. <laughs> but uh, unless we elect a governor who steps in and says, I don't care, you're, gonna, you're not going to make them do it, which I don't know if there is any candidate that would do that, um, or some change at the federal level, I, uh, no one has given us a glimmer of hope that we can uh, stop this train that's coming down the track toward us. Is, would you, Holly, did I misstate anything there? Nope, I completely agree. I want to throw one thing in on that enforcer. You know, the thing that he kept saying over and over again was, okay, it may not be the coliform, but it, it is an indicator that there is a potential for other bacteria to be within the system that would make somebody sick. And with that being said, they did not want to be on the receiving end or we wouldn't even as a political institution be on the receiving end of Joe down the street getting some kind of an infection because of our water. And so it's, it's kind of a, you know, it's, it's a tough, tough one because you're trying to protect everybody. And it seems to me a little heavy handed personally, but on the other hand, I'm not responsible for um, somebody getting sick and getting sued and all the ramifications of that. Yeah. That's kind of ironic, you know, because we're in a time where so many regulations are just getting thrown out the window. And yet here we are, we're getting hammered <laughs> here with this one. And, I mean, and so many others that we should be keeping are getting, you know, tossed out. So. Yeah. Can I ask yeah. a couple of questions, Marita, if that's okay? Pardon me? Can I ask a couple of questions? Yeah. Um, and, and I'll just ask them all at once because it seems easier. Um, so I, I was wondering if the change in federal regulations is, it sounds like DEQ now has the authority where they did not in the past to um, step in and enforce municipalities to chlorinate or treat their water, is that a mandate or is just they now have the authority and they can choose to use it? Um, with I think it has always been there. And um, so DEQ drugged their feet for a very, very long time adopting the revised total coliform rules. And um, really it came to threats from the EPA to withhold funding and things like that, um, or to take over primacy. So we, instead of being under the DEQ regulations, we would be working with EPA directly. And that's what it came down to, is them threatening to pull their ability to, to mandate or to um, manage within their own state. Um, thanks, Holly, that's helpful. Um, and I was wondering under what director of the DEQ did you all meet with them? Was it the current director or? Do you remember? No, it's the current. Current, okay. Yep. We got an assist from the former director who was from Lewistown or lived in Lewistown to set up that meeting. So we had all the right people in the room, but uh, to, uh, to no avail for our cause. Who was that previous one? Uh, well, you guys probably, some of you know Richard Opper. He lived in Lewistown. He went. Uh, he was uh, under the Schweitzer administration. He was the head of DEQ for four years, and then he went to Health and Human Services, with, which about killed him. And uh, and then he retired. But he, we called him, and he called the people he knew in the DEQ. So we were, we were very fortunate. We had all the right people in the room. And uh, but. So you met with? Did you meet with Sean McGrath? No. No, the deputy director is who we met with. Okay. There were, f what, five or six DEQ people in the room, if I remember yeah. right. Yeah, I remember Lloyd. I don't remember his first name. His last name is Lloyd. Um, John Dillard was the, the uh, <laughs> steely-eyed, whatever Dave called him. <laughs> he was very steely-eyed. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I only bring it up, Sean McGrath is the current director of the DEQ, and um, if you all haven't had the chance to talk with him directly, it might be worth a meeting. Um, 
And, and then my last question, and this one is just uh, probably for Holly, and I apologize, I'm just getting up to speed. Um, so if you already said this, um, if you wouldn't mind repeating it, but where did the estimate for the $100 million cost of project come from? Um, so I think they just used a generic formula for pipe replacement. So, so many footage at a, a price, at our area price um, per foot for construction. Um, Holly, that, uh, that was my question uh, since Caitlin just brought that up. This, and did you say 60 miles of pipe? Yes. Yep. And, um, you know, sort of the word on the street is the age of that system. And um, can you co comment on the status of the 60 miles of pipe? And shouldn't this be part of the big picture that we're looking at to, you know, revitalize this water system? Well, and we have a lot of new pipe, um, you know, we, in kind of all of this, where is this, this bacteria coming from? We did a lot of additional testing and exploration to try and isolate um, possible areas or uh, causes of uh, chloroform or coliform. Um, and so we have two lines coming into the town. Um, so we have two, a two, two lines line. coming what? I couldn't hear you into town from the spring okay so we have one that was constructed in the 60s and one that was constructed in 96 and uh both of those the same water the same neither one of them because we know that um you know up until that point we haven't seen any coliform growth um continue to be negative so the even the 60s pipe which the bulk of our pipe is um was installed then. Um, we've got newer pipe. Um, you know, every year we try and replace um, water lines, um, sewer lines, those sort of infrastructure. So we've got um, some pipes that are within probably a decade old. Um, and I don't know that, well, I mean, maybe it would be, um, you know, 10 miles or less within a decade. Um, and then there's some obviously, and the bulk of it, um, you know, many of our subdivisions went in in the 60s when the first Boeing projects were here and those sort of things. Um, but that's kind of the timelines that we kind of look at. And um, obviously there's some that are older in those older neighborhoods and stuff. But again, there was no consistency on um, locations of this, um, you know, reasons, um, you know, is it old pipe, is it, um, a type of pipe or something like that. Um, you know, we looked at dead end lines or different things like that. And there was really nothing that uh, led us to believe that replacing pipes would change the outcome here. So. Uh, but is that an ongoing project? You said that every year water lines and sewer lines are worked on. Is this an ongoing project now that yep. will eventually update the entire system into the oldest of the pipes? I don't know that it, I'm sure that they will continue to do that. I don't think it would be ever accomplished in my lifetime, but yes, they continue to fund those projects and we recommend those projects. So some of the, some of the um, pipe that example um, that we saw looked like a coral reef inside it. And so it was, it was kind of, I always envisioned these smooth inner pipes and no, not even close. So I could see where there's a need, but boy, at that cost, uh, I don't know. Caitlin, do you have any ideas about how a, uh, a municipality could go about funding an enormous project like that? Me? <laughs> <laughs> I guess, you know, what I think is that, I mean, obviously, it's not something you can just say, okay, now we're going to do that. But it seems like it would be the city's long term plan, like I'm talking like 50 year plan, you know. Uh, 
somehow address it. Because yeah, obviously you can't just say, okay, we're gonna replace all the pipes because you even have to get grants and loans to do the limited project that's being proposed now. Mm -hmm. So can I make a comment on that? Yeah. Um, so in a perfect world, we'd be replacing five miles of water line, you know, every, every year. Um, the reality is that uh, the, the city budget is tight and getting tighter. The water, uh, you know, our sewer, our sewer revenues are not, uh, are, we're going to have to raise sewer rates because we're not meeting the, uh, what our auditor says we have to have in reserves. Um, we do, I think every year, Holly, we do address right currently right now as part of uh, the street construction that's going on. I think we're replacing some lines because we're taking advantage of the fact that the streets are torn up anyway, which is a huge expense if you're gonna, if you're gonna replace water lines. But you know, the reality of it is, you know, barring some enormous bond issue, uh, which, which I can't even imagine us wanting to take to the city of Lewistown residents. Uh, you know, it's not a perfect world. And I, I think the city public works does the best it can to stay up with our streets and our, our, our water and sewer system. But um, uh, it does, I don't think we're getting ahead. Do you? Well, always... and, you know, and so the project Dave's talking about, this is, just an example of the cost associated with it. And I mean, that's not even figured into that 100 million is the restoration of the pavement and any other infrastructure, you know, a new fire hydrants or things like that. So literally we are replacing from uh, Realty Title or Lincoln School in Sixth Avenue to, so you're looking at what, three blocks of line and it the uh, bid that the city commission accepted was I believe three hundred and eighty thousand dollars, and so that's what they are doing for that project. And I would guess in the last year, uh, the city of Lewiston put in probably two and a half miles of line of water line or replaced two and a half miles. So I mean they've continued to get in the vicinity of miles of line replaced on an annual basis, not feet or things like that. So they continue to, to make that a priority as well. And a lot of these lines are older, are prone to leakage and things like that. So they're addressing those. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I ask one more question? Because um, I feel like we've been talking about the replacing the water lines um, topic. And, and Holly, you said earlier something about how perhaps even replacing them wouldn't solve the problem. And I might have misunderstood that, but if that is the case, would you mind saying again why, why that's so? Um, it's just very inconsistent. And so um, whether it's in a line or a cross connection or the tank, um, I've said it probably a hundred times. You know, if I knew where this problem was, I can promise each and every citizen that it would have been addressed long ago. Um, so I think it's probably not just one issue. I think it's a culmination. Um, you know, we have many residents that want the ability to have uh, personal wells for irrigation. And so we have uh, ha homes in the city of Lewistown that have, um, you know, the backyard irrigation well um, and things like that and making sure that those are properly uh, cross connections checked and um, backflow prevention is all up to speed, um, especially because some of these have occurred or we've inherited prior to becoming, um, you know, onto our system um, or annexation on these. And so uh, there's a lot of things that could be contributing to this uh, issue um, and there is no smoking gun, so. Mm. No. I, have a, I have a question, um, and that's, you know, this has been a really productive meeting, and you guys have shared so much with us in terms of, you know, looking at options, and also, you know, the, the especially this, that there's no correlation to a material, an area, geographically, or anything else is causing this problem that seems to be pretty intermittent. Having said all of that, um, I am concerned for the general public and how they're going to respond when 
the word gets out further than it is now. Um, I, I, we in the paper. And so I guess I would think it might behoove the the commission and you know the powers that be and public works and DEQ to see what kind of outreach that you can do to communicate what you've done tonight. Um, because I can imagine if people haven't been paying attention, there's going to be a, a hue and cry when this project is initiated and maybe you can comment maybe you're already hearing it or you're expecting it or what have you um to some degree we have we've always you know we appreciate your comments um obviously we are all here to work with the public um and so we like the public participation component and um i think probably most of us that are on the screen have spent a majority of our time with the city um, trying to engage more public. And so if I knew how to do that, uh, we'd absolutely do more. Um, you know, we had envisioned, you know, newsletters and things like that of um, this, you know, when our public, our second meeting, and that's why we did the first kind of intro. And then we wanted to basically um, get the drums beating in the community so that we had a ton of public um, at our next meeting that came with good questions and DEQ um, when we met with them had agreed to come in and participate in this and and be the bad guy I think is what they said um, and so they knew um, we know that we need to do a good job um, you know we've tried and we'll do it some more um, to on every one of our water bills that went out for one month, you know, prior to that meeting, we said, check our website, look here for information, here's a meeting. And that's going to literally every one of our users. Um, but you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them free. And so that's but, kind of what we're up against too. But I think that you need to advertise way more than just in the legals. I mean, I know that fulfills the legal requirement, but um, it needs to be in news briefs. There needs to be an article, uh, you know, saying just that just putting it in the legal isn't enough. Absolutely. And we cannot make the newspaper write an article our certain way. Um, I know that we've encouraged them to do several and and they've obliged us. Um, it doesn't necessarily get across the message we maybe wanted. But you can put it in news briefs. You know, you can write your own news brief and they put it every, you know, any public any meeting that you want to describe can go in news briefs and that would catch the eye of a lot more people than a legal notice and, and i don't really think that you know we're trying to be critical i'm just you know i i think the community if they don't it's going to be a big shock to a lot of people unless they're already unless unless you feel that the community already knows this i don't know um, I what think the awareness do. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of, of uh, concern and stuff like that. I mean, we've been doing this now for a couple of years. And so um, we've definitely had some time to get the community um, aware and, and we've heard from many of them over the course of this time too. So um, we can do better. Again, we're always willing to take suggestions and try, um, you know, all of our uh, meeting agendas do get emailed both to the uh, commission, um, you know, the city commission meetings uh, go to the radio and to the newspaper. Uh, sometimes they'll do a story on it, you know, a blurb on the radio or, um, but often we just kind of get shoved back in the meeting, you know, here's your meeting. The actual topics they include in that, so. Mm -hmm. um, Holly, you uh, made that DEQ comment just recently. So this upcoming public meeting, is that the DEQ is going to have representation at that meeting? Is that what you said? That's what we had always envisioned. Um, right now, um, or at least up until the end of April, they were on a no travel restriction. So they were not allowed to travel for business. Um, I think they've start, started to lessen that. So we're still optimistic that we can get them at the next meeting. Okay, 
Uh, but that there's no date or timeline for that meeting yet. Not at this time. We're hoping we have a large audience. And so we'd really like to get into a situation where we can have more crowds than 10. And, and none of us knows when that's going to be. That's, you know, we're all, everybody's dealing with that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, it's Holly, have they ever checked um, the crick? Coliform? Um, I'm sure there is coliform because it's a naturally occurring bacteria. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more than coliform in the crick too. <laughs> um, but uh, we have not checked the crick itself. We've checked um, for other growth, well, and even just um, like the sampling we've done on the two lines coming into town let us know that there was no crick water in our pipes. Okay. Are there any other questions that anyone would like to ask before we um, move on to another subject and let all these people who graciously donated their time this evening? Uh, just one quick one. Yeah, I know our time is up here, but I just that I know that a number of people in our previous meetings had asked, um, how did you pick uh, Robert Peschen and Associates? And was there a bidding process? No, so what we are required to do is like an RFQ process. So it's a request for qualifications. And then, um, so we had, I believe three firms uh, put in a proposal. Um, and so it's a big package where they're basically selling themselves um, and their capabilities of their firm. Um, we did that, I believe uh, the spring of 2019. Hmm. Um, but that's the process that we okay, have. So to use. How many proposals did you get? I believe we had three firms that actually mm -hmm. put the proposal. Uh -huh. Okay. And so they're, they're going to do the engineering report. They're going to do the engineering for the project as well as the building of the project? No, no. Right Why now, they all they're under contract to do is this. what they're under contract for. Oh, application and PER, okay. So then when it came to actual design, it would be someone else? It's completely up to the city commission. So whether they go through okay. the RFQ process um, or just ask for uh, like an engineered services contract, that sort of thing, um, they would, could and would do those. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, thank you all very much for, for taking the time to meet with us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, and thanks for being engaged and learning more about the situation, too. So, thanks well, to you. Very complicated. <laughs> and thanks, Clint, for helping get it set up. Oh, um, you guys are welcome to stay. We're going to finish up just um, with a little update on a, a statewide water quality program that we're working on if you'd like or if people need to leave there just sign off and, and thanks a lot so um the next thing we're going to be talking about is yeah hey, uh, i'm leaving so th i just want to throw in a thank you okay thank you. thanks glenn thank you Bye. so um so we, uh, Central Montana Resource Council, um, as I had mentioned previously about several years ago, had um, become engaged with the Department of Natural Resources and Conservation through the um, Conservation District. And we were able to work with the Contra Conservation District to get these baseline water tests. And therefore, it's not just like a test for, for uh, coliform and minerals it's for volatile organic compounds that typically you would find when areas of oil and gas exploration so a number we had 25 or 30 uh, families that um, applied for the program and we